So can we get into God's Word? So, so just turn around, grab your Bible, turn with me to the narrative of Scripture that we will use to explore today. Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 16. We will use it in our first installment of this brand new series called Jehovah, the names of God. But I want you to look at your neighbor and go ahead and announce to them the title of today's message, The Rallying Place. Look at your other neighbor who might be seated, who didn't follow directions, and say, The Rallying Place. How many of you have ever been to a pep rally? All right, high five somebody around you and say, We're going to a pep rally today. Then you can be seated. Grab hold of this, this concept, names. Names in culture today have become so creative, so unique, so, so different. Names like North, names like Saint, names like Chicago, names like Blue Ivy. They seem to be so much more creative than Mark. When we're naming our kids, we, we really think long and hard about the name that we want to bestow upon them because that name says something. That name says something about the essence of who they are. In fact, in biblical days, your name was something that would generally define your destiny. You would be given a name that you would actually have to grow into. Like Abraham meant the father of many. Isaac meant laughter. David meant well-beloved. Names, creative names, we think have, is something that started with today's culture. But the creativity of names didn't start with today's culture. It started with the creator of the universe, whose name is so powerful that many other titles and names have derived from the very essence of who he is. He is God. He is Jehovah. He is Yahweh. He is the first, the last, the beginning, the end, the alpha, the omega. Is somebody going to help me? He is Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. He is the ancient of days. He is the bright and morning star. Star. He is Jesus. He is the Father. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Somebody help me. He is Elohim, which means the Lord Almighty. He is El Shaddai, which means God Almighty. He is El Rohi, which means that he is the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He causes me to walk beside of quiet waters. He restoreth my soul. That name. Somebody say that name. Y'all got me preaching all up in here. So she said, that name, Jesus, thank you. So today we're going to look at or begin to look at over the next few weeks several names of God more intimately so that we can find out some things about those names of God that maybe we never even knew. Today the name that we are going to look at is Jehovah Nisi. I'm going to read one verse just to establish some context around the name Jehovah Nisi. Then I'm going to do some work to help you understand what that name means. So I'm going to begin in Exodus chapter 17, verse 15. And what happens when this verse unfolds is that the people of Israel have, have just been in this battle, if you will, down in the valley in, in Rephidim. And, and Moses has been on top of the hill holding his hands up high with this staff in his hands, the staff of God, the staff that's been in the hands of Moses for 40 years. As he's holding the staff over his head, they are winning the battle. But when his arms grow tired, they begin to lose the battle. So Aaron and Ur come alongside of Moses and they prop his arms up. And when his arms are propped up in a prayer and praise posture, then they win the battle. Then he does something in verse 15. Verse 15 says, says this. It says, Moses built an altar, and he called it Jehovah Nisi, which is the Lord is my banner. 
Moses built an altar there, and he called that altar, after this battle, the Lord is my banner, which is Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner has a secondary name, which means the Lord brings victory. Now, let me help you understand this. From a historical perspective, when two nations would fight during this day and age, they would carry into the battle at the front lines a staff that had a banner that represented that country, that nation. As long as that, that banner was in the, the sky, in the air, they had hope, they had encouragement that they could win the battle. They would keep fighting based upon looking and seeing their banner still waving high. If the banner fell to the ground, they would retreat because they knew they lost. So what Moses is saying is that God, the Lord is your banner. <laughs> The Lord brings victory over your life. The Lord brings encouragement over your life. And everything that you go through should have the Lord is your banner over your life. That he, hold on a second, that he is the one who brings encouragement and hope. I don't know if you've ever received encouragement in a discouraging situation. That's Jehovah Nisi. I don't know if you've ever been in a hopeless situation, but all of a sudden hope flooded your life. That's Jehovah Nisi. The psalmist writes, I look to the hills from where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord. That's Jehovah Nisi. Romans chapter 15 verse 13 says that God floods your heart with joy and with peace so that hope will flood your life. That's Jehovah Nisi. Somebody say that name. Listen, this is going to go a lot better if I have some help today. Y'all going to help me preach? Together we can. Keep your finger there. Now let me take you to a narrative of Scripture that we will use to define Jehovah Nisi. Because Jehovah Nisi has, is mentioned directly one time in Scripture, but referenced many times. In Psalms chapter 20, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is our banner, is referenced. But there is something different about this psalm. This is a psalm that David writes, but the composition of this psalm, Jenny, is so different. You see, what happens in this psalm is they're about to go into battle. As they're going, going into battle, the chariots and the horsemen are ready. They have their swords and they have their spears. They have their armor on. They're going into a battle, and they stop by the tabernacle, if you will, on the way out to have this this spontaneous prayer and praise service. What happens in this spontaneous prayer and praise service is captured in such a way that it's placed into the format of a song and the people of Israel sing this song for centuries and it brings them spiritual strength when they find themselves in this place. So let me read a few of the verses for you. Here's, here's what it says. Psalms chapter 20 verse 1 David writes, may the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. Everybody say protect you. Everybody say answer you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. Lord have mercy. That will preach if I had time. What will preach? Answer you, protect you, help you, support you. He will answer you, help you, protect you, support you. He will answer you, help you, protect you, support you. Evidently, no one in here has ever been answered by God, helped by God, supported by God, because you would be giving God some praise. Mm. You'll get there on the way home, maybe. Verses 3 and 4 says this, May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all of your plans succeed. What those two verses mean is when your heart lines up with the heart of God, he will cause your plans to be successful. Verse 5. May we shout for joy over your victory and lift up our banners in the name of our God. Uh-oh. May the Lord grant all of your requests. He says, may we shout for joy over your victory and lift up our banners. May we shout for joy over your victory. May we shout for joy over your victory. May we shout for joy. Somebody's going to help me sooner or later. May we shout for joy over your, wait, may we shout for joy. battle hasn't happened. 
they just stopped by the tabernacle for this spontaneous prayer and praise service. And they are already shouting the victory. Mm. Hold on a second. What they are saying is, <laughs> mm. what they are saying is they understand the battle is imminent. But they also know the victory is imminent because they're fighting under the Lord is our banner. Mm. There is this incredible celebration of joy. It says that they shout with joy. If God has ever helped you, then somebody right now just give him a shout. Woo! Yeah! Something that I've noticed about this narrative, you've got to grab this, is that there is this reference to the truth or to the fact, I should say, that with every victory, our praise should get louder. Hmm. There is this passion and exuberance that is present in this narrative. It is not as if David is leading the troops and he's come to the tabernacle, he's got his armor on, and he looks at everyone who's there, all of the people of Israel who've gathered around, and he does not say, well, guys, um, we're going to go into battle today. And um, maybe we'll win. Give three claps if you think we'll win. Okay, good. Hopefully the Lord will be on our side. No. In other words, we see this passion and exuberance. It's okay to be passionate and exuberant when it comes to who God is in your life. Some of you tonight will be watching TV watching this big game called the Super Bowl. And you will be watching it with such passion. You will not be like, guys, everyone sit down on the couch here. Hopefully our team will win. One, two, three, four. And if our team wins, we're going to all stand up and have one chip. Oh, you're going to be like, woo, yeah, you're going to be looking crazy. Woo, that's my team. Woo, we're winning. As if they know you. And the reason why you have so much passion and you want to cheer on that team is because you feel a connection to that team. You, you, you feel a connection to that celebrity that you are, that you are just, uh, just giving this wonderful praise to, if you will, because the name that's on the back of, of, of their jersey. And, and listen, you, you feel connected to them because if they're winning, and that just means that maybe you are successful because of your connection, but all of that is an illusion. You see, you are shouting something to people who don't know you. You're using the first person plural like we, but they don't know you. You don't know them. So why don't we shout even louder for the one who has caused us to be victorious all alone. The Lord is our God. He is our banner and that banner flies over us. It's alright to shout for your team tonight when they run out with that banner but come on somebody, give God Jehovah Nisi a louder shout of praise. So with every victory, our praise should get louder. Somebody say, the rallying place. Think about this. In this narrative of scripture, we see a couple of things. Number one, there is a battle. But if all of you are here today, you have experienced battles in the past, and you have seen God bring you into victory. Therefore, you are a witness to the Lord is our banner. Which only means that the failures of the enemy should be evident in our praise. Mm. Lord have mercy. So, here they are shouting this victory shout. They're shouting the victory shout, but understand the context of the psalm. They haven't even gone into the victory or into the battle, but yet they're shouting. This preemptive shout, if you will. There is something profound that happens when we can give God a shout of victory, Jeremiah, even though we're not really sure of the outcome of the battle. I 
I noticed something about this text, though. The narrative does not point to the tension that has to be present in that place. Because the battle is imminent, but they truly believe the victory is imminent. But it's not pointing to the tension that has to be present there. You know why? Notice about it doesn't. There are other Psalms that that talk about the distress that we're under. God, I'm broken. I need your help. I need this. I'm in the battle of my life. I'm in this. I'm in that. And, And all of that's cool. There are beautiful Psalms that do that for those times. However, this psalm does not point to the distress in our lives. It points to God's ability to give us victory in those times. Why is that? Because the enemy uses tension as a strategy. The enemy thrives on tension. Did you hear me? In other words, if you have tension in your relationships, the enemy uses it. If you have tension in your finances, oh, this week we dropped over 600 points in the market. Oh, what's my 401k doing? If you have tension with your kids, the enemy uses it. But verses 4 and 5 say that if you commit your heart, if your heart is, is committed to the ways of God, then he and lines up with his heart, he will cause your plans to be successful. Therefore, there is a truth to this principle. I need you to grab this. The truth is that the vocalization of our praise breaks the tension in our lives. The vocalization of praise breaks the tension in our lives. For the joy of the Lord is my strength. Mm. For the joy of the Lord is my strength. Can somebody give God a shout for joy? For the joy. For the joy of the Lord is my strength. So I'm going to give God praise even in the midst of the battle because I know that it will bring confusion to the enemy and the enemy won't know what's happening. But what I already know is that God has brought me through the tribulation. God has brought me through the situation. God has brought me through the aggravation. God has brought me through the agitation. And what I know is that there is nothing that can happen in my life from this, from that situation, from that situation, from that difficulty, from that failure that will keep me out of the victory victory that God has already given me through Jesus Christ on the cross. Somebody say that place. Hmm. Somebody say Jehovah Nisi. You know, there are certain songs. I was thinking about this narrative and I thought, you know, this is the soundtrack for the battle that they're about to go into. And there are certain songs that if I were to sing them to you, your mind would go to a certain movie. Near, far, wherever you are. Or, or what's the other? What is that? Your wager. That's the sound of victory. Do you know what the soundtrack for your faith is? The soundtrack of your faith is worship. Let me get back to the narrative or we won't get done like this. Verse 6. So David responds. It goes back to the singular first person. Now this I know. The Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Verse 7 goes back to this second person, if you will, or first person plural. It says, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we... Trust in the name of the Lord, our God. So verse 6 was David's response. Verse 7, David is saying, hold on a second. All of those chariots out there, 
all of that, uh, all of that armor that you're wearing, that, that sword that's in, in the sheath, that spear that's sitting on the chariot out there, all of that stuff is good, and it may be the greatest weaponry in the world, but that we cannot place our trust in. Our trust has to be in God. So watch verse 8 and 9. He says, they are brought to their knees and, fell, and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. Verse 9, Lord, give victory to the king. Answer us when we call. He's talking about fighting, if you will, underneath the Lord is our banner. Hmm. Huh. Let me take you back to the narrative really quick because I'm going to use Exodus chapter 17 as the illustration for what's happening in Psalms chapter 20. But watch this. Verse, chapter 17, verse 1, says this. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from the place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Now, hang on a second. Let me tell you what's happening when this verse unfolds. They have literally just come out of Egypt, 400 years of slavery. They've only been out for, at the most, at this point, two weeks. At the most two weeks. God freed them from the Egyptians' hands after 400 years. He parted the Red Sea. They walked across on dry ground. The sea enveloped the army of Egypt. Next, manna and quail falls from the heavens. Then they have this week-long praise service. They're writing songs that God's name his praise will always be on our lips god is our provider he he is our he is our defender he is our protector he is our source he is our strength they're out in the desert making all of these songs having this week-long praise service just singing praise unto god lord you are good and your mercies endure it forever dun, 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 dun. You, know, you had to get the, that part in there so they're out there singing all this praise stuff. It's just all happening. God, your praise will always be on our lips. But then look at verse 2. So they quarreled with Moses <laughs> and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord, the God, to the test? Hold on a second. They just got through saying his praise will always be on our lips. You know, it's easy when something goes wrong in our lives to look for others to blame. Rather than think through that scenario spiritually. It would have been more appropriate for the people of Israel to be in the desert to say, you know what, we're in the desert, which means water is going to be scarce. Which means that we just have to keep our minds on God for the answer. But look what happens in verses 3 following verses three and following says this but the people were thirsty for water there and they grumbled against moses they said why did you bring us up out of egypt and make this make us and our children and livestock die of thirst and then moses cried out to the lord what am i to do with these people they're almost ready to stone me the lord answered moses go out in front of the people take with you some of the elders of israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the, the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock. Everybody say the rock. At Oreb, strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. Hold on a second. It says that he struck the rock. Everybody say the rock. We ain't talking about Dwayne Johnson. There's some great symbolism here. Here's the symbolism. There is another name or a title that references who God is, and that is the rock. More specifically, that title points to Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 says this. Put it up for me, if you will, rather than you turning there. Just watch this. Here's what Paul writes. He's writing about the people of Israel who were wandering through the desert, and he says this, that they drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. This figurative rock following them around. The, the, the I need you to grab hold of this because this is powerful. When the people needed water, God provided a rock. 
Now, keep that verse up there. Go back to that verse for me. Think about this. We're not sure exactly how many people were in Israel. We'll call it a million. They know that there was at least a million. There are some counts that say as many as two million. But let's just say there's one million people. And they got two gallons of water a day from this rock. That would be two million gallons a day just for sustenance. No bathing, none of that. Just for sustenance. That's two million gallons of water a day. That's the equivalent to over 16 million bottles of water. Can we say Jehovah Jireh, our provider? Can we say thank God for the thirst because he always provides something to quench the thirst? Can we say that his grace is more than sufficient in a moment of weakness? Can we say that my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory? Well, again, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, it says they drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. This reminds me of the fact that Jesus was with the Samaritan woman, and she was there to get water, and he said, if you'll drink of the water that I give to you, you're, you will never thirst anymore. He said, if you'll believe in who I am, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. What, what God is trying to show us in Exodus chapter 17 it's the fact that if you want to be and receive the promise of God, whether or not you receive the promise of God has everything to do with your proximity to the rock. Oh, Lord. You want the water that's coming out of the rock, you've got to go to the rock. Mm. But here's something that I notice. The endurance of... The faith endurance, if you will, of the people of Israel seemed to be very conditional. They were looking for signs and wonders. You see, if, if your faith is built around signs and wonders, and the only time that you can identify that God is with you is whether or not there's a sign and a wonder, what happens when you don't have the sign that you're looking for? You will be wondering who God is and where he's at. Can I tell you something? The conditions in your life do not change who God is. Again, so if the conditions don't change who God is, then our worship cannot be changed by our conditions. Verse 8. Verse 8 becomes the illustration, or, or verse 7. Let me read it first before we go to verse 8. It says, and they called the place Massa because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Time out for a second, because you got to understand something about this complaining session. This happens after, grab this, this happens right after, not long after, God has proclaimed himself to be Yahweh. I will be with you. I am the God who's with you. I am for you. I am your deliverer. I am your peace. I am your hope. I am your sustenance. I am your help. I am your joy. I am that. It happens not long after this quarrel, if you will, happens not long after God identifies himself as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. It happens two days after the fact that they have gone into the desert, if you will, and God proclaims himself as Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals, because they walked into this desert situation and they didn't have anything to drink and they came upon this body of water, but the water was too bitter to drink. So God healed the water so that they could have water to drink and he proclaimed himself to be Jehovah Rapha, the, go the God who heals. But then this complaining session comes out based upon the conditions in their lives. Therefore, if, if, our, if our conditions do not change who God is, our worship cannot change because of our conditions. So God uses an illustration to show them right after they ask this question, is the Lord among us or not? Watch this. The Amalekites came to that same place and attacked the Israelites. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Ur went to the top of the hill. Verse 11. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But, whatever he, but whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Okay, now what you need to understand is that this is a, this is a Hebrew posture of prayer and praise. So here is, here is Moses on top of this hill with his hands up, holding the staff, if you will. But there's some symbolism here. Look at verses 12 and 13. I've got to show you this. 
verses 12 and 13 says, when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and they put it under him and he sat on it. Aaron and Ur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Hmm, hang on a second. Let me help illustrate this. So here is Moses on top of this hill holding up this, this, this staff. There's a couple of things happening here. Number one, Aaron and Ur come alongside him when, it, when his arms are tired, which just means together we can. <laughs> Somebody say together we can. But there's something else that is so profound that is happening at this moment. You see, this staff that Moses is holding in his hand is a staff that has represented the brokenness of Moses for 40 years. 40 years Moses was in the desert as a shepherd, tending someone else's sheep. 40 years. We know historically that shepherds would take the staff and would carve certain important events in the staff to remind them of where they had come from. There was nothing good to carve into Moses' staff because he, he felt like he was rejected. No one would accept him. So many insecurities, so many difficulties, so many failures. Here is the staff. However, God came to him and said, I am with you. I am Yahweh. I am with you. He said, what is that in your hand? Moses said, it's a staff. So he threw it on the ground. And you'll remember the story. The staff turned into a snake. He picks up the staff or picks up the snake and it turns back into a staff. At that moment, that staff was no longer a staff that was called Moses' staff. But now that staff became called God's staff. Hold on, because it's going to get better. Hold your hands in the air. Everybody, you're holding the staff in the air. Everybody, hold your hands up. Hold your hands up. Okay, so you've got a staff in your hands. This same staff was the staff that Moses took before once it became the staff of God. Keep your hands up. This is an exercise, an aerobic exercise. That same staff is the staff that Moses took before the Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And Pharaoh had such fear that he let the people go. This is the same staff that Moses would raise over the Red Sea and it would part so that the people of Israel could cross over. And, the, and then it closed over the Egyptians. This is the same staff that he raised in the air and manna and quail began to fall down from the, the sky because God would provide. This is the same staff that he used to strike the rock and water began to flow. The point that I am trying to make is what once represented Moses' problems while the people of Israel were down in the valley fighting. They would continue to look up at that banner. Don't you remember how I told you it worked? They would look up at the staff of God. This staff no longer represented the problems of Moses' life. This staff now represented the promise of God. Mm, Lord have mercy. You can put your hands down. Most everybody has. So, if this staff represented now the promises of God, Joshua kept fighting with his men. He would look up and see that staff up. He would fight under the power of that staff. Why? Because that staff was his banner. <laughs> that banner was not Moses' staff. That banner <laughs> was now God's staff. Hmm. Verse 14, put verse 14 up for me. Verse 14 said, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll, something to be remembered, and make sure that Joshua hears it, because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Why did he want Joshua to hear it? He wanted Joshua to hear it because, number one, he wanted Joshua to realize that it was not Joshua who won that battle. It was God who brought them into victory. But he also wanted Joshua to realize that you will face the Amaleks again, the Amalekites again, but they will never be able to defeat you. Then verse 15 and 16. Verse 15 and 16, it says, so Moses built an altar and he called that altar, the Lord is our banner. He said, because hands were lifted up. Mm, hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Hold on a second. So I had this 
I had to stop. Why is it that we lose the battle so many times? Why? Why do we lose the battle? We lose the battle because so often we're not fighting under the Lord as our banner. We're fighting under something else. You see, at Rephidium, they had two problems. They had a water problem and they had a battle. But that was not their problem. Their problem was they had forgotten to fight under the banner. The Lord is our banner. They had been fighting under this broken nation that had just come out of Egypt. And so when the banner was placed on a staff and walked to the front lines, they still didn't believe in that. But when they saw the staff of God and it became their banner, they realized the Lord is our banner and he will cause us to have victory. Now, now, hang on a second. Hang on a second because you've got to grab this. So Moses on top of the mountain holding this staff up and they continue to look up because they're fighting. They continue to look up and they have hope. They have encouragement that they're going to be victorious. They keep looking up. Moses holding the staff was only a physical manifestation of the truth that God would bring victory. The point that I'm trying to make is as long as they were fighting and Moses was shouting for victory and he had his hands in the air, they were victorious. You see, at Rephidium, they had two problems, a a, a water problem and and a battle, and God gave them victory over both. Why? Because the Lord is our banner. Hold on a second. Therefore, I wrote this down. Don't allow the manifestation of the problem to rob you of your motivation for God. Can I preach for a minute? You think your problem is this. You think your problem is that. You think your problem is your finances. You think your problem is your kids. You think your problem is your marriage. You think your problem is your husband. You think your problem is your neighbor that you want to, you know what I'm saying. You, your neighbor. Okay. Anyway, anybody ever had a bad neighbor? Okay. I'm the only one. I don't have a bad neighbor now. If you're watching, man, I love you, dude. You are. But that's not your problem. That is just the manifestation of a deeper problem. The deeper problem is rather than you shouting for victory, you've played out the scenario on your lips and you've taken the praise off of your lips and you've spoken about the problem more than you've spoken about the banner that is over you. And when you speak about the problem more than the banner that is over you, God can't walk you into the victory that he has predestined for you to walk in because you have taken something else that was contradictory to his word and you've begun to live by it. Oh Lord, what I'm trying to say is stop blaming others, stop blaming this, stop blaming that, stop blaming this. And I came today the same way Moses did, to challenge you, to get up on your feet and to put a victory shout in your mouth because he'll take that dry place and he'll bring his water he'll saturate that place with the water of who he is he'll take that battle and he'll march you into the victory because he is Jehovah Nisi he is the God who is our banner he is the Lord who brings us into victory good Lord have mercy mm. So, think about this. Rephidium became known the rallying place because this water would flow out of this rock as long as they needed it. And they would go back to this place to get water. And every time they went back to this place, they would remember all that God had done. It was the pep rally place. So, here's the deal. Over your life today, the Lord is our banner needs to be proclaimed over your finances the lord is our banner jehovah nisi jehovah nisi over your marriage jehovah nisi over your situation jehovah nisi over your kids jehovah nisi over your jehovah nisi over your job jehovah nisi over your finances jehovah nisi over your neighborhood jehovah nisi over your school jehovah nisi over your house come on somebody give him a praise up in this place give him a shout a victory shout 